the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The prophet Joel's call to fast and repent comes under the threat of an imminent invasion. Jerusalem was about to face a military conquest from a foreign power, which Joel explains is a judgment for the sins of the people. In light of these events, the call to actively turn back to the Lord was itself nothing unusual. Fasting, prayer, and almsgiving were the three most common forms of worship in ancient Israel, and particularly during times of crisis. Since the time of the judges, these corporate acts of penitence arose when the burdensome fear of an oppressor pressed down on the Israelites to the point that they cried out to be delivered, to be set free again as God had set them free in the Exodus and in the inheritance of the promised land. To fast in those days was to participate in a prayer that the judgment for sin would be propitiated, that the enemy at the gates would, might be turned away, and that the people might be permitted to get back to life as God had established for them to walk in. Too often, though, that repentance in sackcloth and ashes, in fasting and prayer, proved to be a perfunctory and temporary humility aimed at getting back to life as it had been known just before things had begun to get beyond the people's sense of control. Their prayer was not really to return to the way of the Lord and faithfulness to the covenant, but to the last point of comfort and perceived self-possession. Communal penitence had become little more than a collective self-help project. The ceremonial fasts became a way of trying to wind back the clock of unfaithfulness and its consequences to the point where the pleasures of compromise and infidelity could still be enjoyed without any of the negative side effects. In the marital metaphor so common in the prophetic literature, the people wanted enough reconciliation in their covenant marriage with God to enjoy the perks of being his spouse, but also wanted to retain the ability for the occasional fling on the side. Joel's call to rend the heart and not the garments was a call for a genuine repentance, an actual sorrow for sin by each person from the heart. Only then would the collective ceremonial fast have substance. The call to individual repentance from the heart did not negate the call for the whole people to gather in a sacred assembly. All would still be called to drop what they were doing and attend to that moment before the judgment was pronounced. Faithfulness to obey the call to an inward change, though, would make all the difference as to how each person met the ending that was about to come. Joel's call to fast and pray, in the end, did not stop the invasion and the fall of Jerusalem. There would be no more of that effort to retain a sense of autonomy from God for many centuries, for many years of performing enough ritual humility to get back to the life before the point of crisis. The way of all things would suddenly cease as the judgment of God brought the kingdom of Judah to an end. To fast and pray in those days led one to realize that they could not, in the end, allay the disaster. They could not save the world as they knew it. To fast and pray instead would mean being turned back to the Lord and made able to see that in the midst of the cataclysm and the exile that was surely to follow, that the Lord was there as he always was, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. To rend the heart and not the garments was to be freed, to see 
that as the world and its devotion to sin and death were allowed to pursue its ruin, that the Lord had never stopped being faithful and would not stop being faithful to all those who remain turned toward him to seek him face to face. By the time of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, another threat of invasion loomed over the post-exile people of Judea. It had been announced by the last prophet of Israel, St. John the Baptist, and then by the Lord himself as he commenced his ministry, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' call to fast and repent signals that the kingdom of God is at the gates. It is invading the world, and that all other worlds are now coming to an end. Like Joel, Jesus calls the people to fast, pray, and give alms. He presumes that these practices are already in hand. Yet Jesus reorients these ancient practices to a new end. No longer are they the outward habits of prayer that judgment might not fall. Rather, they are now the disciplines which incarnate our prayer that judgment would fall, that God's kingdom would come, and that it would come soon. Rather than turning to God as a rescuer from invasion, to pray and fast and give for the disciple of Christ now meant to welcome as the invading king the Lord who is gracious and merciful. We pray not to restore our ways of life, but to renounce them so that the kingdom of the Lord might prevail and rule over us. Today, we are called to join in that spiritual conquest, to join the cause of the kingdom as it invades the world and overturns all of its ways. Our fasting in Lent is not a sign that ruin is imminent, but a sign that redemption is imminent. Our penitence is a receiving of that redemption. We receive ashes today as a reminder of our, and a reminder of our death as the starting place of Lent. It is a sign of all that we leave behind tonight to pursue the thing that is yet to come. We do so in order to acknowledge that there are still ways we are complicit with this world and what it values. The ashes represent a world that is passing away, one that can only cause us harm, though, insofar as we devote ourselves to it and then suffer loss when it dies, as it only can. The cross of ashes can disturb only those who have made their home and found their security in that world. And in whatever ways that describes us now, Lent now comes as a severe mercy to break us free, to return us to the Lord, and to find him as he always is, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, ready to redeem, and ready to heal us. Ash Wednesday is not an existential crisis unless it needs to be for our salvation. We put on ashes not to be ostentatiously morose or melancholic. That is why the ashes are in the shape of the cross, the sign of the Lord's great victory over death and all of its servants. To receive our ashes today serves to start our experience of Lent in obedience to the Lord, as we go immediately hereafter to wash our face and not to appear in the eyes of men to be fasting these 40 days. It is a hopeful reminder that the ash of our lives can indeed be washed away if we allow it to be, and that our dustiness cannot efface the mark of our adoption as children of God. It is no accident, after all, that we receive the ashes where once we received the chrism at baptism and confirmation. Those marks are forever. We do not put on ashes again tomorrow. Those ashes are fleeting. The real challenge of Lent, though, is to receive our ashes in our hearts as well and to seek continually 
in the next 40 days for the Lord to make us clean of those ashes, to make us clean in our hearts within us. In whatever parts of our lives we cannot or do not yet pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Those are the places where now our fasting, prayer, and almsgiving need to be directed. Those are the ashes of our lives that need to be washed away. To name and acknowledge those places where ash has collected in the heart is what it means to make a good confession at the end of Lent. To welcome Jesus into those places is what it means to keep the good Lent. And that is why that while we begin this service with ashes, we end it with Holy Communion. Owning the ashes now, we turn to Jesus and welcome him in the Eucharist. To remember and experience again what is the end of the Christian story, the resurrection and a renewed creation. And as we bear with humility the healthy shame of our dust, May we take heart in the fact that despite our dust, the Lord is gracious and merciful to draw near to us and in steadfast love to give himself to and for us to make us clean inside and out. Lent has begun. The world is ending. As St. John the Baptist proclaimed, the time is now fulfilled. Repent and believe the gospel. And as our Lord said to his disciples, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars, and on earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.